In the early 1800s, Vermont farmer Timothy Garfield faced a common problem. The family farm wasn't big enough to subdivide among his children to ensure their financial futures. So he sold the farm for $2,000 and headed west. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Although the government was still many years away from selling this land, by the time the Garfields arrived, settlers had already claimed most of it, not only for farming, but for land speculation. In 1841, the Garfields paid $650 for the claim to 440 acres, which gave them the right to buy that land when it went on sale. The original claimants, who were cash poor, received a large profit for being first on the land and used that money to start another farm further west. Typical of the families that settled in this area, the Garfields had both experience and money, and they bought up huge parcels of land. It was also a time of many changes, both social and technological, as we discovered here at the Garfield Farm Museum in La Fox. Large farms meant surplus production, which was taken to Chicago for shipment back east. So much wheat was produced in this region that by 1850, Chicago had become the world's largest grain port. Well, today we're cutting hay, not wheat. But whether you're cutting either one, it was a tough job, which began about 4 o'clock in the morning and went on till about 11. Then everybody would pause for dinner while well, the heat built up and they'd come back about three o'clock and work until dark. On a good day, one man could cut upwards of two acres. But around the time the Garfields arrived, inventions such as the McCormick Reaper were increasing farm production and generating other changes. Over. Jesse, ha. These were the tractors of the early farms, oxen. Unlike horses, which are harnessed, oxen were attached to wagons and plows by a wooden yoke. There was no bit in the mouth to steer them, so they had to be taught certain verbal commands. Come ha, ha, ho. Training a team to work together was a time-consuming process. And here's an interesting fact. Farmers used only oxen with horns, so the yoke wouldn't slip off when they went downhill or came to a stop. But new equipment like the reaper needed to be pulled faster in order to allow the gears to spin at sufficient rate, and that meant horses. So by 1861, Mark Dunham from down the road in St. Charles was importing draft horses from France. Come up. Step like over. the disappearing oxen, life was changing so much oh. that by 1890, Timothy's daughter-in-law, Hannah off. Garfield, suggested the farm be saved as a museum. Eventually, her daughter, Elva, would accomplish that goal. It was here in 1841 that Timothy Garfield bought prime farmland, not only to ensure his children's future, but because it was on a great location. From here, the roads that ran to Oregon, Illinois, St. Charles, and Chicago converged. And like the family before them, the Garfields operated an inn. Business was so good due to the increase in grain shipments that five years later they erected this brick building. It cost 37 and a half cents for an evening stay, and that included supper, breakfast, and stable. But lodging did not include a separate room or even a bed. What it meant was a roof over your head. And if it was very crowded, it might mean a chair in a corner. This was the tavern room where men would gather in the evenings, drinking, smoking, and discussing national events. Hard cider and whiskey were the drinks, and in 1846 the conversation was dominated by the Mexican-American War. In the ladies' parlors, there were also discussions. Among the topics discussed there might be voting rights for women, or alcohol consumption. So it might be said that in parlors all across the country, the seeds of the temperance movement and the suffrage movement were planted. Compared to today, people drank heavily. In a world with few medicines and no aspirin, many use whiskey for pain relief. 
And it might also be that people drank simply because of the conditions of everyday life. It was a smelly environment. People bathed only once a week, if that often. Cloth was so expensive that most people had just one outfit that they wore in the field for days. Plus, there were the animal smells that people picked up. So it might be that people drank just to get through the night. Upstairs was the dance floor, and on display are four of the original ballroom chairs. This space doubled as the guest room. Here, men would sleep on bed rolls or straw ticks. The women and children all shared a separate room. All those people, along with the family members, had to be fed. Here in the kitchen, the Garfields had one of the hottest selling items of the 1830s and 40s, and it's credited with helping women live longer. It's a wood-burning stove. Before its conception, cooking was done over an open fire where it was easy to get burned. The infection, which often resulted from the burns, was the second leading cause of death among women. In the corner is this original large paddle-wheel butter churn. It's a reminder that since transportation was not fast enough, all excess milk had to be converted immediately to cheese or butter. This is one of the oldest buildings on the farm a barn built in 1842, but it wasn't big enough to meet the needs of both the family farm and the tavern business. Road traffic was increasing. In fact, there was a tavern almost every mile along the main road. So in 1849, the family built this second barn, which was designed to hold up to 28 horses. That turned out to be a bad move because that was the same year the railroad came through the area and life on the farm quickly changed. Road traffic dropped off dramatically as farmers could now ship their grain without spending days on the road. And the days with the Garfields operating an inn were now over. It also meant that milk could now be shipped to Chicago. So this farm, like many others, began to make the slow transition from grain production to dairy production. Another change that occurred was a precise tracking of time. Now it was important to know exactly what time it was so that you could follow the railroad schedule. Well, besides just these old buildings and the displays of 1840s farming skills, the Garfield Farm Museum also promotes the preservation of plant and animal species, not only to show visitors what was here, but also to protect the original gene pool. One species that was popular was Merino sheep. Originally from Spain and prized for their wool, they were carefully guarded by the monarchy. It wasn't until 1820 they appeared in the New World. While they always had wrinkled skin, farmers began breeding the sheep to create even more foals. The more wrinkles, the more wool. But with the invention of electric power, smooth-skinned sheep became more desirable because they could be sheared easier and quicker. These black java are considered to be the ancestors of today's modern farm birds and were brought over from Southeast Asia on clipper ships. Today it's estimated there are only about 500 of these birds left. They were the preferred bird in the poultry market because it was easy to see how cleanly they had been plucked. Black feathers stood out against the white skin. A head count of the animals demonstrates how quickly farm life was changing. Records show that in 1850, the Garfields had seven milk cows, seven cattle, two horses, 20 pigs, and 20 sheep. 10 years later, they had almost 100 sheep. But by 1870, there were no sheep on the farm at all. It had converted exclusively to dairy products. When the Garfields arrived here in 1841, their land consisted of a large grove of trees surrounded by open prairie. Insects were horrendous. In fact, during the summer, the cattle wouldn't even enter the woods because of the swarm of black flies. But like the farm, the surrounding landscape was changing quickly as the marshes were drained and the plows turned more land. But here at Garfield Farm, there are still 20 acres of prairie land which has never been plowed.
Today, parts of the prairie along with the marsh have been restored. And today, like then, Garfield Farm is in a state of change. But this time, it's returning to the past. During the year, volunteers and staff demonstrate the skills that were needed to run a successful farm in the mid-1800s, and restoration work continues on the old buildings. Here's an interesting sidebar. For an office, the museum moved a neighboring house, which had been built in 1849 by Atwell Burr. He was a cousin of Aaron Burr, Vice President of the United States, who shot and killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. On the other hand, the Garfields were from the same family that produced James Garfield, who in 1880 became the nation's 20th president, and whose term was cut short by an assassin's bullet. In addition to site interpreters, the museum hosts a myriad of events throughout the year, all designed to teach new generations about life in a long ago time. To find out when the Garfield Farm Museum is open for tours, or what events are coming up, call 630-584-8485 or log on to their website at the address shown on the screen.